Oh, see, oh, sisters and brothers, brothers and sisters. We come now at this time to think about Epiphany. Epiphany is January 6th, and the first thing you're probably thinking of is, well, what exactly does Epiphany have to do with, uh, with Christ? Because the first thing that most people think of when they hear the word Epiphany is a revelation. And that is very appropriate because having a revelation is a part of the life of Jesus in that uh, really truly understanding and comprehending the fullness of the meaning of the life of Jesus is an epiphany. And so uh, this time in this beginning of this uh, season of the quiet time in our Indian religious tradition, winter time, the month of January especially, is what we know of as the quiet time. And I'll talk some more about that here in a little bit. But uh, during this time of Epiphany in the quiet time, it's a good time to explore the meaning of Epiphany and the relationship that we have with Jesus. And so we begin our readings this morning from the Hebrew Bible, looking at Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 6. This is Isaiah 60, 1 through 6. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But God will arise upon you, and glory will appear over you. <clears throat> Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. And your heart shall thrill and rejoice because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you, all the young camels of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of God. And our reading from the New Testament today is from John chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. This is John chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. And, and John is often referred to as the, the working man's gospel, the every, you know, the everyday man's gospel. Uh, there are some, some significant differences between John and the Synoptic Gospels. But... Uh, in this sense, one of those differences is uh, the correlation of, the, of Christ and God. And so uh, we start with chapter 1, verse 10. He, meaning Jesus, was in the world, and the world came into being through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own and his own people did not accept it. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory. And the glory of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to God's heart, who has made 
him known. Here are the words of the Gospel of John. Epiphany is commonly recognized among many Protestant communities as being the time of acknowledging that the Magi came to the birth of Christ bringing gifts. We all know the story of the three kings, but we'll call them Magi, and we don't know, you know, we won't get into the historical side of that too much right now, but as far as Epiphany is related, the Magi came to acknowledge the esteem of Jesus and brought gifts to help him in his journey. And the gifts are very symbolic of the many stages that you saw would go through in, in his ministry and of the suffering that he would endure. It is an acceptance, Epiphany is an acceptance of Gentiles, of Christ's mission to Gentiles, of you saw being here not just for the select few, but of for the many throughout the world. And so when we think about Epiphany, we think about how we have the opportunity to come to understand and develop a relationship with God as Jesus had with God. But Jesus set the quality of the relationship, that standard, God, Jesus raised that bar to a level that we are expected to also achieve. And Epiphany reminds us that we have been accepted by Christ and by God, but we do have the responsibility to look at our relationship with God, look at our relationship with Christ, evaluate where it's at and where we'd like it to be and set some goals uh, that we can, you know, realistic achievable goals for this next year to help us grow and evolve in that relationship that we can become the living presence of God's Spirit in this world, setting a good example for others to follow. Uh, in this Indian religious time, it is the quiet time, the time of reflection, the time of thinking about the past year, the opportunities that we have had, and how we have responded to those opportunities. And I'm not talking about just casual opportunities, I'm talking about the opportunities that God has presented to us in our life, in our journey of growth in our relationship with God and with the rest of the community over this last year and how we have engaged those opportunities or not engaged them. How we have responded to them. And to think about what our motives were, as people in recovery would say, or at least in codependency would say, to own our side of the street, to take responsibility for the choices that we made and the actions that we took, to acknowledge the consequences that they have had, and to evaluate how we could have done things differently. To take that wisdom that we gain from this and to strive to apply it for future opportunities that God will put in our path that we can make better choices. And in so doing, be a better service to God and the community and to grow and evolve in a better way. Setting that good example for us to follow. Well, that seems like an awful lot, but, you know, let's think about how Jesus 
took advantage of the opportunities or responded to the opportunities that were put in his life by God. And we look at the gospel, what we're talking about here in John and Isaiah, and uh, you know Isaiah was really speaking to his people at the time when they were going through a lot of struggle, and he was affirming that God's living presence, God's spirit was upon the people, with the people, and that things were going to get better. And so he was, in, he was speaking to the people, inspiring them, that if you continue to do right by God, then you're going to have good blessings in your life. And when we look at John, we see a reflection of the same kind of challenge, the same struggle that the people of Isaiah were dealing with in John's time. You know, the author of John is speaking to the people in his community at the time where he was living when he wrote this, uh, addressing the challenges that were existing between the more traditional Judaic people and the, and the evolving and growing Christian community of that time and in that area, and even the challenges they were having setting that boundary of inspiring them to understand that, hey, you know, Jesus was here from the get-go and helped bring the world as it is into the world of it today. And yet, when Jesus came into this world, at least in Palestine, uh, people didn't know who he was when he showed up, didn't recognize him or acknowledge him as a prophet or the Son of God, rejected him, and what did they reject him for? Well, he challenged the status quo, he spread the message that abuse and uh, exploitation of others for, for personal gain, especially abuse of power, was not acceptable, and he went around curing the people usually on times and not acceptable according to the fundamentalist Judaic people. And he challenged people to be better than they are and to strive for peace among all people, reaching out to everyone and not just the chosen few. So basically he rocked the boat and he was calling upon the people to be better than the sum of their parts. To be better than they were. Fulfill their potential. Strive to fulfill their potential. And because of that, he was rejected by a lot of people. But those who did reject him, as we read here in John, were given the power to be the son or the children of God. And we, we see this in Ephesians also. We talked about that before. Uh, where we are joint heirs with, with Esau in the, in the kingdom of God. And, uh, well, I use kingdom loosely because that's what I read all the time, but, you know, as a Native American Christian, you know, we're not too concerned about kingdoms because God's not real big on being a king, more about being in community and in fellowship. And so in the community of God, we all have the ability to be children of God within the community of God be welcome at the table. And uh, in that sense of reaching out to everyone, uh, saw was challenging those who believed that they had the control over everything, including his own, his own disciples, who were reluctant to share with those who were considered outsiders from the full-blooded Jewish people. <clears throat> now, that's not unique to contemporary times right now. Uh, the work that we've done for Sacred Hoop and other, other ways over this last year has really been a revelation of, of how many of these challenges still exist in contemporary Christianity. You know, churches are closing down because they refuse to be open and receptive to others who are different. Uh, 
who refused to grow and evolve, to open up their horizons and to see and feel the spirit from God's perspective and not from their own. So he saw was challenging people during that time, including his own disciples, to basically tell them to lighten up, get with the program, and you know, hey, everybody is okay. And let's let's make everybody welcome. And you know, there were disciples who were in opposition to that. And so Christ had to deal with that too. Uh, just as today, you know, there are uh, many denominations who reject American Indians, who reject American Indians within their own cultural context, who expect American Indians to assimilate into mainline society, to abandon cultural identity. Uh, so there's still very much a problem here in North America. And that is evidenced in many ways. And it's not just here in North America, it's around the world that this challenge exists. And the reason I know this is this couple of pages I've got here. If you look at, uh, you know, uh, Pope Francis. Yeah, Huffington Post reported, uh, trying to get the date here, back in 2013. So this is a couple of years old, May of 2013. Pope Francis says, atheists who do good are redeemed, not just Catholics. Pope Francis rocked the world when Pope Francis said that everybody is welcome at God's table, and not just Catholics. And, uh, you know, personally, I've, I've had my challenges with the Catholic Church over the years. Uh, and so, i got to admit, I was pretty shocked when this came out. And, you know, a lot of people have short memories, so I thought it would be a good time to remind people at this time of Epiphany how the things that Pope Francis said. And, I, and they, he says this about Christians and Catholics. They complain, the Pope said in his homily, because they say, if he is not one of us, he cannot do good. If he is not of our party, he cannot do good. And Jesus corrects them. Do not hinder him, he says. Let him do good. The disciples, Pope Francis explains, were a little intolerant. Closed off by the idea of possessing the truth. Convinced that those who do not have the truth cannot do good. This was wrong according to uh, Jesaw and Pope Francis. Jesaw broadens the horizon. Pope Francis said, the root of this possibility of doing good that we all have is in creation. And Pope Francis is basically saying that Jesaw wants us, insists that we broaden our horizons, that we let go of our need to be right, to possess what God has created and to welcome everyone at the table. And this rock Christianity when it came out, I remember that. There was a lot of controversy about it. As Pope Francis went on further and says, the Lord, uh, God, Yohiwa, created us in God's image and likeness and we are the image of God. And God does good, and all of us have this commandment at heart. Do good and do not do evil. So, according to Pope Francis' perspective, Christ offered himself as a sacrifice for everyone and not just the select few. And what does that mean to us today? Now, I've heard it said by Protestant ministers in North America that if you are baptized into Christ, it doesn't matter what you do after that, that you are saved. I grew up with that. My grandfather was a Baptist minister on my dad's side. 
I got to tell you, it kind of concerns me a little bit. To me, it was a statement of saying that, you know, once you're saved, that's it. You don't have any more responsibility. And that's the way it was intended when I heard it repeatedly. And I'm still hearing it. I'm not sure that that's consistent with, well, let me rephrase it. I know beyond the shadow of any doubt it's not consistent with God's intention for us, or Christ's intention for the life that he led and the sacrifice that he gave. We do have a responsibility to grow and evolve as spiritual beings and as human beings to the best of our potential. And what is our potential? And I ask you that. How many of you actually thought about what is your potential? So what is it? Sit down with a piece of paper. Write it out. What is it that when you were a young person that God compelled you to do or grow to be? What is God speaking in your heart that you know you should be doing? And you're not. How do you respond to Pope Francis' statement that God is welcoming everyone to the table, even the people we consider to be our enemies? And believe me, I've got some challenges with some of this sometimes, like lunatics down the road in our peaceful community shooting off machine guns and on Christmas Day detonating a bomb so powerful that it shook every house for more than a mile around them. I know, I've talked to the people who own those houses. Scared the crap out of everybody. 11 o'clock in the morning, Christmas Day. Boom. I don't like those people. I have a hard time with that. But I know they're welcome to God's table. So I guess I'll work it out with them down the road. We'll see how it goes. But I'm just saying. How would you respond to that? In this quiet time that we have, it's a time of thinking about these things. It's a time for us to get real with ourselves. To think about our regrets. Think about the what ifs. And how important is it for us to continue to be in our comfort zone and to keep doing what we've been doing than it is for us to get out of our comfort zone and make those necessary changes to be what God wants you to be. The kind of person that you can become. Epiphany is a time of meditation on how much you really value what Jesus has done and is doing for you and how you intend to share those feelings within you, with others, over this next coming year. Think about that. Welcome you.